Iowans know a thing or two about a hard day's work. That's why we do things the right way at Barntown Brewing. Grain to glass beers brewed in house. Scratch made food handcrafted with fresh locally sourced ingredients. We work hard for the reward of watching our guests enjoy great food and beer. Barntown Brewing. West Des Moines, Waukee. Craving the one and only Fong's Pizza? We thought so. Fong's Pizza in Cedar Rapids now delivers. Order direct delivery or curbside pickup from Fong's Pizza by calling 320-9992. All of your Fong's favorites and a Fong's spin on the classics from their mega pepperoni to the Iowan and street taco. Delivery, takeout, car side to go. Call 320-9992. Fong's Pizza, Nubo District, downtown Cedar Rapids. HawkeyePodcast.com. Thank you very much for listening and or watching, however you are consuming this content. And uh, really excited for this episode to be welcoming in uh, Iowa swagger legend Jordan Bohannon, who among many other things in his Iowa career made 364 threes, dished out 639 assists. That's the fourth most three-pointers of any players who began their college career in 2015, 2016, I think the way that Jordan did. And Jordan's also just one of two players in at least the last 30 years of college basketball to make at least 364 threes and dish out 300 or 639 assists. And he's also the guy that I once said was a fallback recruit, and I question whether or not he was good enough to play guard in the Big Ten. Jordan, after all that, thank you for still coming on and doing this interview. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. And I know we already talked about how I, I saved uh, a lot of the people that doubted me and their what they wrote about me on Twitter and uh, mentioned me on Twitter. You, you're <laughs> definitely one of them that <laughs> built the fuel of my fire. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Listen, I'm glad to play a part. And I, I want everybody to know because I, I just feel, especially at this stage of life, I made sure that when I reached out to Jordan, who I was kind of surprised, you know, we were, I was on Twitter last week. We record this the uh, 5th day of April, 2021. I was on Twitter last week. Jordan obviously was very active with the uh, name, image, and likeness, um, you know, tweets and news that was taking place last week. And, and I began to be, um, chime in on those and interact with Jordan because I really respect what he's doing. And then he followed me on Twitter, which I was kind of shocked by because I think maybe at one point in time when I had the ad hoc I nation account you might have blocked me and more power to you so when he followed me you know I got to shoot my shot I said hey man I'd love to have you on and talk about this but just to be transparent I did say this about you a long time ago and Jordan's like yeah I know I know you did <laughs> I, I know you did and I, I I love that aspect that's one of the things uh, we'll, we'll delve into that a, a little bit more in this but I, I want to tell you folks first what this is not going to be um, if you want to hear Jordan talk about more specific details and aspects related uh, to his decision on and whether or not to use the additional year that the NCAA has granted him and other players um, or his recent conversation with NCAA president Mark Emmert or his thoughts on why Big Ten teams have struggled recently in the Big Ten tournament, which his opinions on that actually echo mine. I encourage you to tune into and subscribe to his podcast. Many of you probably already do. I think they've hit 100,000 downloads. Um, his podcast, The Standpoint, um, and it's episode 31 where you can hear Jordan and his co-host Zach talk about those things. Because um, I don't want to waste your time, Jordan's time, or my time really going over those things. So let's do a few things differently, Jordan. And if you, I, I'd love first, let, let's talk about the name, image, and likeness uh, activism, which I think is a good word, that you're involved with. And I want to ask you, where did this begin? Where did your passion for this topic begin? Were you inspired by, you know, Nigel Hayes and his, you know, broke college athletes, anything helps sign when he shared his Venmo several years ago at Wisconsin? How did this form to be a passion for you? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Actually, it's funny looking at my pathway to advocacy for college athletes back in middle school, late middle school, uh, around seventh, eighth grade, I wrote actually a research paper regarding not paying why, why, why I believe college athletes should not be compensated in college. So looking at that back to middle school to all the way to high school where I'm at or to college where I'm at, 
and thank you back kind of the pathway I've taken my, my mindset towards this topic, you know, it's kind of extraordinary to look at because I was really heavy against it. And then, you know, I learned a lot more. As soon as I got into the business of NCA, I realized how truly corrupt it is. And there's a lot of people that talk about it all the time, but when you're actually in the business, you, you see a lot of this stuff from behind the scenes about people being paid throughout, you know, high school, going to the college level. Now you hear all these shady conversations that are going on with these players. You hear about the NCA, Mark Emmer. And, you know, honestly, after the rug incident, which was really pure sarcasm, it really took off my legit advocacy for, you know, name, image, likeness and work with, my, with the NCPA with Ramogi Humo. So that was kind of the, really the first start of actually uh, kind of stepping to that scene. And for those of you that are not familiar with the rug incident, it kind of sounds like an episode of The Office or something. Go listen to The Standpoint, episode 30, where I think you talk a little bit more about that in the latter half, the latter part of that episode. By the way, folks, I mean, I've said this Mark, when Mark Morehouse and I've talked on this podcast and every other episode that Jordan's not been in. You've heard us talk about The Standpoint. I've tweeted about it. So I'm not saying uh, things just because Jordan's here. It's, it's really cool to hear an unfiltered and have a direct conduit. And I kind of imagine that's kind of what the standpoint name came from. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. You said a couple of things here. One, I like how you said advocacy uh, as opposed to activism. That's a good word. Um, and you talk about the business, the business of the NCAA. It's kind of maybe the first time I've heard it used the way that you did. Um, and obviously most businesses, many businesses, any business is ripe for uh, corruption. Did you witness, and I'm not asking for specifics, did you witness corruption during your recruiting time or become aware of it during your time as a college athlete? And has that actually amplified why you're like, why are we, why are we doing this behind closed doors and in dark alleyways? Why don't we bring things out into the light? Yeah. Um, there's several instances that I have experienced that and I, I'm not going to get specifics yet. Sure. I do want to. I do want to talk about it at some point, whether that's me deciding to write a book about everything right. or uh, you know on my podcast. But there was one athlete that came through in my five years at Iowa, and um, we heard about how shady this family was and coming through um, on campus at Iowa, and then we realized him coming somewhere elsewhere and found out you know how much he was paid and how he was paid. So it, it happens, you know, people talk about it all the time. It does happen. I'm 100% saying it, that, you know, keeping, you know, the outside world to at ease here, that it does happen and it happens on a daily basis. You saw that with Bill Self already, they're, you know, investigating with him and, and Adidas. So it, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a daily thing at the college level. So what, what was it, when was it that changed your mind from the seventh, eighth grade um, paper that you wrote, feeling at those times that players should not be paid. My assumption is, is that you felt that a college scholarship was enough of a payment. Was Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think to say scholarship was a payment at that point in my life. And I mm -hmm. didn't really realize what else there is a part of the, the business like I was talking about with NCA. But it really wasn't until my brother, Zach, made the final four run and he started talking more and more about the inconsistencies with this organization that they deem themselves as nonprofit. And obviously that's mm -hmm. not the case with, you know, president Mark Emmer making almost right. $3 million now. So um, I think when he was going through that final four run and he was talking about, you know, bringing a water bottle that wasn't, you know, endorsed by the NCA into, you know, a practice and the NCA official had to, you know, make him rip off the label and throw away the water bottle. So that was kind of the first thing I was like, wait a minute, this doesn't really add up. And then mm -hmm. after that, I tried to learn more and more as I could. And um, I think that's, that's the most important thing I've taken away from all this because my freshman, sophomore year, I didn't really speak out much about this issue. Um, I could have, but I wasn't really, you know, knowledgeable of it. And I wanted to, my brother restrained me from doing it. And then it wasn't until this junior senior year where I started to learn way much more. And I was able, I was confident enough to, you know, have a dialogue with people that have opposing opinions. And I think that's been the main thing. Why did your brother try to stop you from becoming what we've seen over the last couple of years in your early years? Yeah, I mean, I think he wanted me to talk about issues that I'm knowledgeable in because as soon okay. as you speak your mind about it in the public, all hell breaks loose with your <laughs> asking you. And I mean, you know how it is. Everyone asks you <laughs> questions and you have to just be really prepared 
Right. And as soon as I felt at the kind of level, I was prepared enough to talk about it. You know, I kind of let the floodgates open and, um, you know, try to have as much dialogue as I could, because at the end of the day, I'm not trying to argue with anyone with the issue. I'm trying to state my advocacy for it. If you don't, if you disagree with me, I'll try to listen to you. But I feel like this is such an issue that it's really not that hard to figure out if, you know, the minds then see it came together and figured it out. So you met recently along with some other, um, gosh, I don't, is student athletes even a word that we should use? I, I don't know. It, it seems kind of goofy. Some other players, so whatever, um, you know, uh, Geo Baker being one of them, you got a chance to meet with NCAA president Mark Emmert recently. Um, do you feel first that what came from that meeting is either a next step in the evolution of potential adoption of players controlling their name, image, and likeness? Or do you feel that that was a dog and pony show and posturing by Mark Emmert and the NCAA placating people such as yourselves, giving you a little bit of a, you know, a little sliver of meat now go away, uh, Jordan and everybody else. What, what was your feeling after you left that meeting on what it was? Uh, we really appreciated him taking the opportunity to meet with us because he obviously is a busy guy right now during this time period, but we knew what it was. It was a publicity stunt by the NCAA. They wanted us you know, to kind of fulfill that publicity standard that, okay, we're listening to these college athletes. And college athletes is the term I use, not student athletes, if you're okay. wondering, but you. <laughs> college athletes that met with the with Mr. Mark Emmert. And, you know, it was just a kind of – an open dialogue. Nothing really was accomplished. We submitted our three requests that we wanted, you know, to further, you know, the blanket waiver was definitely the top priority. We thought that is you know, by far the easiest thing for him to put in, especially the title nine requests that we did as well. But, you know, the blanket waiver would go along great with the transfer portal waiver that they kind of put in effect this past year. So um, I, th I think it was progress somewhat, but at the end of the day, we knew what it was going into it. Blanket waiver for the uninitiated. And I think that there are, it would be unwise to make an assumption that a lot of people know a great deal about the name, image, and likeness aspects that are going on. Because I think some people, and I'll get into this in a bit, just want to plug their ears and say, la, 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 take your, you know, shut up and dribble. Don't do this. Don't do that. Blanket waiver. Can you explain what you mean by when you said that? Yeah, so our blanket waiver pretty much deals with the idea that name image likeness that is being talked about right now. Already, the NCA you know has been talking about it for the last two and a, two and a half years, trying to you know they create a committee on it and said that they were going to get this accomplished. They never did. Uh, they used COVID as an excuse, which I believe that COVID was even more reason to adapt it than ever. Uh, but they've been delaying it nonstop. Now Emirate wants to wait for the Supreme Court to have their ruling on. Um, the educational base uh, expenses um, that's currently being argued right now. But uh, I, I just think that the idea of our blanket waiver kind of limits that delay that has been occurring for so long. We made it public enough for them to kind of realize that there's a lot of support for a lot of people that believe in image likeness. And I think it's a great idea to transfer to transition into from going now with the blanket waiver into a real life name image likeness law that, I mean, it's going to happen at some point. It's just a matter of fact when. It, it is. And and I spoke with someone today, Jordan, before we had this interview. Um, and I want to be really careful um, to not say too much about this person. But I, I can say with 100% certainty that this person um, has been and will be in rooms uh, at a significant, uh, significant conference. Um, where these discussions are being talked and have been discussed amongst chancellors, presidents, and athletic directors. And this person says that it's, it's fait accompli. They know that it's coming and that these power conference institutions also have frustrations with the NCAA. Uh, quoting the person I spoke with today said, the NCAA is where things go to die um, and that they know it's coming, but their biggest concerns right now seem to be agents and the potentialities for corruption because if name image and likeness uh if that if there's you know if that becomes the standard where college athletes get an opportunity to profit from their name image and likeness which i'm fully for that there's going to be some uh, unscrupulous characters that come alongside try to take advantage of college athletes 
just as just like there would be good intentioned per people and agents that would help college athletes deal with things like taxes and, and, and filing and things of that nature. Because if you start earning income, those are things that you have to do. But then again, so would you, if you were a 22 or 23 year old, you know, going to work uh, and you didn't take college, you've got taxes there. What would you say to what I think Jordan is the biggest concern that these uh, power conferences have is the potentialities for corruption with bad agents? Yeah, that's a normal, you know, con that's a part of this. Um, but at the end of the day, the corruption that's occurring is already happening with NCA, and people think that oh, we're just adding to the corruption that's occurring. And my, in my viewpoint, the things that I've looked at and researched and you know, I've learned as much as I could the last you know year or so with mm-hmm. Ramogi Huma and NCPA, that it would almost limit that that ability to because there's going to be even more transparency with these agents. They're going to have to. You know, talk about even more what's going on with these deals that they're, you know, making. At the end of the day, there's going to be corruption in anything you do. I, I believe there's corruption in a lot of things in life. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of professions out there. But um, the biggest corrupt, corrupt, corruption there is right now is the college athletes not having name, image, or likeness. And if they want to keep using that as an excuse, I understand. Right. But I think what's happening is way more corrupt than them having to deal with. You know, shady agents, which is already happening right now. I think it's well said, Jordan, and I and I agree with you. I had several people since I chose last week to be a little more outspoken on the NIL uh, issue. Um, several people DM'd me privately, as I, you know, maybe I'm a glutton for punishment, but I keep my DMs open. Um, and I think the most common thing I saw was John. There are going to be unintended consequences that go along with this if we just allow college athletes to have control of their name, image, and likeness. And I said to each and every one of these people, I'm like, just because there may be unintended negative consequences that happen isn't a reason to do something. I can go through history and talk about things much, with all due respect, much more significant in the history of mankind uh, that just because there might have been something that you couldn't imagine what bad could come from it, it still doesn't mean that you do it. And I agree with you. I think the positives vastly outweigh the negatives. And it it boggles my mind, even though just seven or eight years ago, I was like seventh grader Jordan Bohannon thinking that it was enough for college athletes just to get their scholarship because, of course, I had to pay my stu- my student loans and pay my way. They're already getting enough advantages. And I actually started to have a Twitter exchange pretty heated with Jay Billis back in about 2014 about this. And I said, why don't you come on my podcast and we'll talk about it? And he said, here, yeah, that's fine. And he sent me his number. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> he, he freaking called my bluff. And I started to think about it. I'm like, of course I'm going to do this. I'm not going to run from Billis. And I got to thinking, I'm like, Dude, he's going to depant you on this because this has been his mission forever. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I chickened out. I hate to admit that, and I've never told. I just told twenty five thousand people that. But <laughs> that, that that whole thing about, I, I guess, Jordan, I don't, I don't know if you feel this way. I, I think a lot. I, I think a number of issues, or a common issue that a number of people have, is a better way to say it, with this and their objection to college athletes getting control of their name, image, and likeness, is jealousy, and or envy, because they didn't have the opportunity to do these things. But when you sit back and you look at this country, you look at capitalism, you look at the systems that have been in place for a long, long time, it almost to me feels un-American that someone like yourself that helps to bring in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for an institution is not allowed to participate in that. Yeah. 100%. It's, I mean, you said it right. to the nail in the coffin. It's un-American for what they're doing on these college athletes across the country. The fact that we're being limited on our name and image like this and people want to talk about how it's a big issue yeah this is a civil rights issue the the majority of college athletes in the college athlete population in ncaa are majority african-american i mean you look at the statistics statistics on it it's a fact and a lot of these guys that are coming from families are under the poverty line not Mm -hmm. only is this going to help for a lot of these families um, that have their kids that live out their dream of playing the love the, the game that they love that they're growing up Mm-hmm. They're able to help not only themselves, but possibly families, you know, local communities as well. This 
this will not only affect just the players, but it can help immensely the communities or the restaurants, you know, private businesses around, you know, this, this, these the campuses across the country. So I truly believe this just isn't affecting, you know, college athletes positively. There's just so many positives that's what, that will come out of this. Um, and I, I'll always believe that until this is finally adapted to the law. And like I said, this is a civil rights issue. Uh, this is more, this is bigger than I feel like what a lot of people are giving it credit for. Hmm. I had not considered that. And maybe I've just not been reading the right places or not reading enough tweets, but I had not considered that. And that's a really interesting angle to uh, apply to this. We're talking with Jordan Bohan. That's, that's just an old radio talk show host thing. I don't, <laughs> I don't need to identify the person again. It's not the top of the hour. I, I do want to say thank you though, to our sponsors. Uh, and that would be Fong's pizza in Cedar Rapids and Des Moines, their website, Fong's F O N G S pizza.com Barntown brewing. Uh, you can also find them in Des Moines. And I think making their way over to Cedar Rapids, Mark and Pete are going to have a podcast soon and you can learn a lot more about their beer. And I love the root beer offerings uh, that they have, as well as Heartland Flagpoles and Flags. That's heartlandflags.com, where uh, I get my Kansas City Royals and Iowa Hawkeye flags from them. Appreciate their support of the podcast. And before long, Jordan, depending on whatever you decide to do, hopefully you'll be able to start uh, selling advertisements on your standpoint podcast uh, before, in the next, well, who knows when. We'll, we we will, <laughs> won't touch on that too much. But um, so last week was a bit of a watershed moment um, for this NIL issue for you specifically, but also for other student athletes in the state of Iowa. When um, Senator Whitmer, I guess, decided to not bring, uh, what was it, uh, 245, Senate file 245 to a vote. Uh, and you talk about this on the standpoint, um, and I think you talked about it right well, uh, very well when you talk about how things getting out of the subcommittees, it seems like that, all that had to happen was Senator Whitver bring this to a vote and the floodgates potentially in the state of Iowa, like they have been in eight other states, Georgia, most recently, Colorado, California, uh, among others, they've allowed name, image and likeness uh, laws to pass in their states. So many of them this summer, it's, it's, it's crazy for me to think Jordan, that some of your peers uh, this next year, on college campuses, depending on what state they live in, Florida, California, Georgia, et cetera, they're going to be able to begin earning money on their name, image, and likeness, but not in Iowa. What do you think it came down to for Senator Whitver as to why he didn't bring this to a vote? I honestly couldn't tell you. I think this is an important issue. It has a lot of popularity, I believe, that if he's that worried about reelection, I think that could have helped him out if that, if that would have come down to, but I really don't know. It came down to politics in some way, shape or form. Um, There's a lot of momentum after we drafted the bill and got out of the subcommittees unanimously. And there's a lot of momentum going forward. And all of a sudden it just took a stop for whatever reason. But um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of cons that he, me and him actually spoke on the phone mm -hmm. uh, about Wednesday afternoon. And we talked about a lot of, of his concerns and, you know, one of them he brought up was the idea of these bigger schools only getting richer, which the idea of him not passing this, I mean, you saw that with a lot of these southern states, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, you know, California has a lot of big time universities. All mm -hmm. these big time universities are realizing how much this will help them out, not only getting these big time athletes, but how much money they can make on their names when they get to these universities. So um, it kind of counters his argument of the idea of him waiting even longer that these SEC schools, these big time universities will continue to grow even more because of the fact they submitted this already, a lot of them in the, this summer upcoming. So um, I think the floodgates are already open and the gap's going to grow even right. farther. And I think it's a good thing. Like I said, for these athletes, I want as much as I can for them to get the basic rights that they deserve. But at the end of the day, um, an issue like this shouldn't come down to politics. And it was really unfortunate to the momentum of this bill just stop like that. Yeah, Occam's razor is one of my favorite uh, philosophical and logical application principles. Um, the simplest explanation is often the correct one. And invoking politics probably really fits right into Occam's razor solution on this as to why it didn't happen. Because I agree with you, this person that I referenced earlier, um, this uh, you know secret person, um, they also told me today that these universities, the universities are going to capitalize even more than they do already financially if they would allow the NIL 
to be widely adopted. I mean, think of, you know, I, I cracked up today when you were pretending to be uh, upset with all the attention that Luca was getting <laughs> on the standpoint and you were joking. <laughs> but th think of how much run that Luca has gotten recently. And if he were able to sign a uh, apparel deal of his own uh, before a senior season, Iowa – because he's wearing their jerseys, they're going to participate in that revenue that comes from that. It's probably some type of revenue splitting between Luca and the University of Iowa. Think right now, I said this on Twitter the other day, if Caitlin Clark uh, was allowed to capitalize off her name, image, and likeness right now, she would probably be signing a six-figure endorsement deal right now. I would almost guarantee it. Think of Spencer Lee and the endorsement deal he could sign. Iowa would be benefiting from each and every one of these things. Is that how you see it as well? Yeah, 100%. And think about the strong businesses that support the universities. Like, think about Hy-Vee. Hy-Vee signing mm -hmm. a large deal with you know, Luca, Caitlin. It would be unreal amounts of revenue for not only the college athletes, but it'll help the business and it'll help the universities even more. And there's just only positives that would come out of it. Uh, and I think, like you said earlier, what it comes down to is a lot of jealousy and envy that – you know, Luca gave his heart out for four years. I know Luca won't say this publicly, but I fully believe that he would would have liked to make, you know, I think he would have made almost up to a million, million and a half a year this year. And people might think that's high, but the notoriety that he got this year, along with Caitlin Clark, she would have uh, had the opportunity to make a, a crazy amount of money this year. And she will continue the next three years. And um, I think that's why a big reason you see Caitlin Clark speaking up now like she yeah. has, which is awesome. And I hope she continues to do that because – um, there's so much popularity with women's basketball now, and mm -hmm. uh, she has an opportunity to do something special. This year was a big year, I think, a, a big step in the right direction for the popularity of women's basketball. And I think Caitlin and Paige Buchers, is, uh, they're, they're a part of that. You know, I had so many people last week when I brought up the potential revenues um, that I think college athletes could be earning. And I said, and I tweeted this one out specifically, I said, I think that Luca and Jordan um, – and uh, Joe Wieskamp at the least this year, off from this year's Iowa basketball team, just from this year alone, would have earned six figures, would have earned six figures in endorsement revenue. And people are like, well, how do you know that, John? Well, I'm like, you know, I, I run a business. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years, both in the world of, you know, Hawkeye websites, but also the energy company that I own. I know how businesses work. What did I just do five minutes ago? I just rattled off three sponsors that are paying me money to advertise on my podcast because, you know, we launched this podcast on March 4th and we've already had 100,000 downloads in the first month. There's a reason why they're paying me to get their message out. Well, look at your Twitter account. Look at your, well, I was going to say, look at your Twitch account. We got to get the <laughs> Twitch followers a little bit higher, which we'll do here later. But look at Luca. Look at I me. Mean, you guys, for, for many college athletes, Jordan, this, is close to the peak earning opportunities that some will have. I'm not saying you, I'm not saying there isn't a whole career after basketball, but for some people, the iron is never going to be this hot as it is right now. And it feels almost, ex well, not all, it feels exploitative that student athletes don't get to partake in that. I'm basically saying, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's, it's, it really pisses me off. When I sit here and I, I know about the power of compounding interest, I know if you could go stick $125,000 uh, into the markets right now, by the time you're 55, that's seven figures without ever touching it. And you're not able to do that. So in your, what do you think, what do you think is fair? What, if, if, if someone came to you right now and said, Jordan, we're going to make you the czar, you, you know, you've been bugging us so much. We're just going to, if you can't beat them, join them. You're, you're a czar in this. What do you think is fair for, for college athletes? I mean, the bare minimum us to get us our right to our name, image, and likeness, like every other student across the entire country on campus has. And you know, I, I, I know I have a lot of people just think I'm reiterating myself through you know, a lot of the talks I've done on articles and talks with you know you now and talks on my you know, social media platform, but it's that simple. The idea that we're being limited when we sign our national letter of intent, and a lot of people are like, well, "Why don't you just go play somewhere else?" The the NCAA is a monopoly. Where else are these athletes going to play? This is That's the true. only opportunity, only opportunity that, that are being provided. And yes, 
we're very grateful for where we are. We are grateful the NCA has given us these opportunities. We're grateful for the scholarship. We're grateful for the clothing we get. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of other stuff that's going on for us not to get our name in Jalankis. I mean, you look at the clothing aspect, we're basically walking billboards for these brands that are going out into the public and getting the rights to these all these college athletes' names. It's that simple. And people, like I said, will continue to say we're ungrateful. We're very grateful. And I said this with Reese Davis when we're having a roundtable discussion. We're so grateful for opportunity. We want to make it better for the future generation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people think I'm selfish for, you know, talking about this. Oh, he just wants to be paid. But, I mean, the whole idea of you going to college is to get money for your profession. So is everyone else selfish for wanting to have money? Uh, but I just think that's an idiotic yeah. argument. I, I've heard that the other day. I was like, that just doesn't, that doesn't sound right if you're thinking about it in the, in the scope of things. It's the best. I heard you. I heard that on episode thirty-one of the standpoint today. Listening to that is, I would anybody that came to me and asked if I was you and said, you know, I think you're selfish. I'd say, well, did you go to college? Yeah. Why did you go to college? Mic drop. Next question, please. It's over. You go there to better yourself, to put yourself in a situation so that you can financially capitalize on the rest of your life. It that that's 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 a mic drop answer right there. Um, <laughs> you know. I said earlier, I'm, I'm not going to ask you questions about a decision that you do have because the NCAA has granted you and other uh, student athletes a, an extra year of eligibility. So you could actually come back to Iowa next year if you wanted to. And I think you were alluding a little bit to that earlier when people just a minute ago when people were saying, oh, you just want to come back for the money um, because you know you sent out a tweet last week that said if, if Iowa passed um, file 256, la you know, brought to a vote and and uh, student athletes, college athletes in the state of Iowa were allowed to capitalize on their NIL, you would come back, which I would say, yeah, you should. Um, but you have an interesting, several interesting wrinkles, I think, to this decision. Because I think the NCAA, in a way, slow plays people like you and people like Geo and people like Nigel five or six years ago because they know there's something that's ticking. And it's a clock and you're a fifth year senior. You're going to be what? 24 years old in June, 24 yep, years 24. old. Yep. Yeah. 20, 24 in June. Well, how long is Jordan going to want to stick around and be an advocate? He's just going to go. Um, he's going to, you know, take a shot at his professional dreams uh, in America. And if for some reason those don't work out, he'll go overseas, make some good money there. And if he's overseas, he's going to be in a different time zone. He's not going to have time to be an advocate and a pain in our ass the way that he has been these last couple of years. So let's give him this little meeting and then he can go on and live the rest. I got a little bit of an advantage and I'm not on the standpoint today how much of a passion that you has have you given thought to and by the way this is like no Socrates attempt to get you to stay in Iowa. I, want, I want you to do what's best for you I've loved watching you play and you've done more than enough uh, for me and, and Iowa fans everywhere but do you ever think about that that this is a passionate a thing that you're passionate about you've invested a lot of time talent and treasure uh, in, in this and if you're playing ball in Europe or somewhere else it's tough to burn that wick at both ends for something like this. It probably needs a lot of attention and focus. Yeah, 100%. I, I knew that when I first talked to my brother, Zach, about it, when he was advocate, when he was at Wisconsin, he talked to Nigel Hayes, and that was a big reason why Nigel, Nigel Hayes spoke up when he did. But that's the idea of the NCAA. You come in, you sign your letter of intent, you play four to five years, and you're out. Whatever you hold to believe in yourself internally and everything you possibly could have advocated for for those four to five years, it's very hard to get organized and help the other, the future generation coming in because they're all thinking about playing time, playing time, right? Getting a scholar or uh, getting a degree with your scholarship, all that stuff. There's so many things that are going on freshman sophomore year, which I believe was a big reason why I didn't advocate a little sooner as well because I didn't have time to do this in the first place. Mm -hmm. But um, as I kind of became more knowledgeable, like I said earlier in the show, that um, I started wanting to learn more, and that was a big you know, with the NCAA, that, that's what happens. There's a cycle. These kids learn something and they move on. These kids learn something and they move on. That's what the NCAA wants with this corrupt business that um, anyone that signs a national letter of in, and it, it's truly a monopoly. They have the rights to these kids as soon as they sign that letter um, and they just wait for the new bash to come in. And um, it's very hard. Like what we did this past year, incredibly hard to organize athletes across the country. Yeah. I've, 
I talked to hundreds of athletes over the course of the season. For us to even have that Big Ten meeting with all the player representatives early in August was huge. And we just took off from there with this kind of 14 to 15 players from each of the teams in the NCAA tournament. For us to do that, uncharted waters. Me and Gio were talking about how hard it was. We're like, yeah, it, it's for sure going to be hard because no one's ever done this before. And I think that's what was so special about what we did because it was uncharted waters. No one ever did it before. And we're continuing to accomplish what we want to accomplish, whether you know, that side pub, public doesn't like it or not. It, I mean, this situation provided a springboard for a lot of future athletes to continue to talk about these issues, just like you see with Kalen Clark. Hmm. It, it almost seems like a, a type of critical mass formed around this very organic, very quickly, more so than I've seen in previous either intentional attempts or kind of back into an attempt and an opportunity. This seems like there's something here. That's something that can last. And that leads me to the shut up and dribble crowd that I, I know that you've encountered a lot on social media. Um, and it's not a, in, it's not an insignificant number of people that feel like, Hey, listen, you're, you're getting your opportunity. Be quiet and dribble. I don't know how many tweets I saw at you this year <laughs> where people were like, Hey, you're, you're being a distraction. You're being a distraction to your team. You're out doing this podcast. You need to be focusing on the team. And I didn't see it that way, but I heard you say something on episode 31 of The Standpoint today. I, I, I want to get your read on this. You said, because um, Zach, your co-host, asked if you'd made your decision on what you're going to do next year or if you'd spoken with Fran or anybody in the team about it. And you said that you had not, and you added this quote, I don't want to continue to create distractions within the team. And I heard that, and I kind of marked it. I'm like, I want to ask Jordan about that and let, give him a chance to clarify. Do you feel that you were a distraction? within the team this year because do you use the word continue or is that just like a a word that got tossed out talking do you feel that you this was distracted at all from the team yeah I mean obviously there's a kind of an aura about me where I'm very outspoken and mm -hmm. um, people kind of have figured that out that I'm one of the more <laughs> polarizer polarized athletes there yeah. has been coming through the Iowa so right. um, you know there's a couple of my teammates that want to be advocates for you know, name image likeness. And I've talked to them, you know, privately about it. And mm -hmm. some of them were on the meetings when we met with the Iowa centers that a lot of people don't know about. There's a good amount of teammates on that call with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think at the end of the day, there there's other important issues involving basketball, not just basketball itself. And mm -hmm. um, I felt like I kind of opened the eyes to some of the athletes on my team this year about it. Um, hopefully they'll be speaking out about it, you know, after they're done graduating, but if they don't, it's no big deal. Um, but I feel like, you know, when we were on the court, that it was all basketball. And it's hard to think, I mean, athletes or people that aren't athletes that have never experienced, you know, kind of this level that we're playing at mm -hmm. don't really understand this mindset. But we've always had this mindset, you know, especially my freshman class that I came in with. We were kind of the free-spirited guys that kind of shifted this program, I'd like to say, to more people that, you know, like to, you know, be themselves off the court, you know, with myself, Cordell, Tyler Cook. You know, just go down that line, Ryan Craner. All those guys were huge guys that kind of shifted that kind of tide of the program. Mm -hmm. and I think that's essentially what made us so much fun to play or fun to watch. And, you know, I, I don't think I was distraction. You know, some teammates might say differently, but I think what they thought I was doing was very admirable, uh, something that's bigger than myself, something that's bigger than the whole team and something that's bigger than basketball, really. And um, at the end of the day, if, if it made us lose a couple games here or there, but this is going to get accomplished. I, I honestly, I would take that. I would mm -hmm. take that in a heartbeat because I think this is a, such a huge issue that would change a lot of college athletes' lives to come. I, I was actually secretly hoping that everyone would refuse to play um, when the NCAA tournament started, and I saw the "Not My Property" hashtag going. I'm thinking, well, shoot, just don't, just don't go, just like strike, walk out. Don't play. Uh, that would get their attention really quickly, but that would be really, really hard to organize. But I mean, obviously, you know, you're in the locker room. You, I didn't play at the college level. I, I played at the high school level and locker rooms are pretty sacred places. Bonds are formed. You would have known whether or not your advocacy was something that was gnawing at anybody, but you just said that there were teammates that were right there along with you. So I dismissed that. I, I also would not call you a polarizing figure maybe a little bit of a lightning rod but certainly not polarizing amongst your teammates uh and i want to talk about that when we wrap up here in a second um 
I wonder what are you considering doing post basketball career? Because I, I mean, that's not just a, Hey man, what what are you going to do? And this is all over. Like this is the first question they teach you in J school, but I'm curious now with your involvement in this advocacy at such a deep and involved level. um, What, have have your post basketball career aspirations maybe changed from when you came in to college due to this advocacy and have those aspirations and goals maybe shifted to become a conduit to stay involved in things like this yeah i feel like i've provided myself you know hopefully an audience that has gave me a little bit of credibility whenever i, I say something or mm-hmm. that's social media or you know interviewers or whatnot but you know, I feel like I've opened up a pathway for myself to kind of go different directions, whether that is college athlete advocacy, which I believe that I always have that in me somewhere because once I start something, I want to finish it. And mm-hmm. I started this thing, you know, a couple of years ago and I want to continue going through it until I see an image of life has passed uh, throughout this country. So I think that's a, you know, one of my main priorities throughout the next chapter of my life. But you know, I always said I want to play professionally, whether that's a chance in the, in the league or you know, G League or playing overseas I think I have given myself a couple options to do such that Um, but at the end of the day you know I I think I've tried to seem like a good person off the court I've tried Mm -hmm. to do good you know I I spoke out about a couple issues but it's nothing that I'm not knowledgeable in name and likeness deals with basketball I've never you know decided to go outside that landscape of non-basketball if I do, it's about motivation and motivating people to do better in life, to be decent human beings. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I, you know, li- kind of lived that life off the court these last five years to pr- to kind of set myself to do something like that. For sure. And, and there are, I, I've told people this for years. I, I started doing whatever it is that I do that I do back in 1999, and um, grew up in West Branch, not too far from where you grew up. Um, And I've always tried to tell people because I've gotten to know some college athletes through the years. And then pretty much after they were athletes, I didn't really try to get to know them when they were athletes. Um, And and I've learned about the time that college athletes at the University of Iowa specifically spend in the community, um, spend on the community. And a recent example of that, the, the unfortunate and tragic passing of Tate Schaefer, um, Tater Tough, which is, you know, your Twitter icon as we speak. My, my brother and the West Branch golf team knew him well. They were, I think they went to the celebration of life ceremony that you were at. Um, Williamsburg, small towns. You and your team had an opportunity to, to get to know Tate uh, during his living time. And how you, you guys just spend so much of yourselves. We, we see what you expend of yourselves on the court. We read about the hip surgeries that you have in the off season, and then this interior labrum tear that you had while still shooting 38% from three this year. We, we hear about these things, but you guys give so much of yourself emotionally off the court that people don't really see. How do you, how do you walk that balance, Jordan, of not giving too much of yourself? Because it would have to be really, really hard. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what's been so special about the Fran McCaffrey era that how great they are with giving back to the community. And and I've always thought of myself as someone that, you know, a lot of people that know me personally and what I do, I write, you know, the word why on my shoes. And, you know, I I was searching for that, you know, for the first year or so at Iowa. Um, And it wasn't until, you know, late freshman, sophomore year until I truly realized, you know, what I thought my purpose was when I got to Iowa. And that was kind of to create a, inspiration for these younger kids in the communities Mm and um you know the count the countless trips i've i've made to the children's hospital you know i the kids that are suffering you see them you know they they start crying your family Mm starts their their family starts crying you know i I teared up a bunch of times when i when i visit these kids and Mm -hmm. to know that you know my why is to help bring light to a lot of people's life it's not to you know, obviously there's gonna be adversity for myself, but it's nothing what people are facing throughout the community, throughout the entire country, especially throughout the state of Iowa. And I feel like being a college athlete is more than just being a basketball player. And I've prided myself in, like I said, being that kind of figure that these younger kids can look up to. And if they see me, you know, on the streets, I'll, you know, talk to them. I won't be all that Hollywood character that a lot of people believe that some college athletes are. 
I think that's what was so special, not for myself, but my teammates that I played with that we all have high character and we all want to help this community out. And I think, like I said, is why this era of basketball players has been so special here at the University of Iowa. You know, you mentioned Fran in the McCaffrey era. Um, there have been three things that I've been critical of Fran uh, in his career. All right. Three, three is the only thing. I, three are the things I could come up with. One is his uh, two foul participation <laughs> choices of substitutions. I'm not a fan, but I'm not the coach. Um, the second would be uh, his infrequency of timeouts. That's, I'm, oh. I, I, I'm, I'm just a watcher. But the third one was the one I've been most vocal about was his demeanor at times on the sidelines. Now, I would say the last two, maybe three years, I've seen a noticeable change and much more control. It just rubbed me the wrong way, and I admit that that's a personal thing. But what I did a few weeks ago uh, at HawkeyePodcast.com is I kind of went back through his era and took a look at the guys that transferred. And I was able to recall the circumstances and situations. Some guys had a fifth year opportunity, you know, uh, recently, you know, Cor Cordell did that um, and, and Moss did that. But most of the other guys that left, it was, yeah, I get he left. And there's a reason why he was either not good enough or he screwed up this, that and the other. And what it led me to believe just from the data, Jordan, is Fran McCaffrey a player's coach the way that it kind of seems like to me that the data is pointing on. Yeah. He might be fiery and crazy on the sideline sometimes, but it seems to me the hypothesis I have from the data is the players know that he's fighting for him. And then he actually is probably a player's coach. 100% that he's definitely should be labeled as player coach. I mean, you saw that as that example you just used as with, with Tate Schaefer. I mean, he'd come to that funeral and I was there with him sitting there. Um, that just shows you how invested he is not only in the community, but these college athletes, they knew, he knew how much Tate meant to Iowa basketball program, how much mm -hmm. he meant to, you know, the team. And, um, and he was there to be with that family and that community. So um, there's countless, countless, you know, stories I could tell of my you know, personal battle battles with myself, you know, going through tough times through the years, you know, fighting through injuries and him just being there and saying, you know, just keep being yourself, keep playing with that swagger. And I always loved when he said that to keep playing with that swagger because I knew that, you know, I'm, I'm a very confident person on the court. So whenever he says that, I kind of got to a different level. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he just knew what to say to the, you know, certain people on the team. He knew that you can't say some things to someone um, because they might take it differently. And I think that's what makes him a great leader because he understands that concept. And he instilled that in every single player that's been through his program through mm -hmm. the years. Mm -hmm. Just a few more things. And I'll let you go. Um, by the way, people, Jordan and I are recording this while the national championship game is taking place. And he said on the uh, standpoint today that he hadn't watched any NCAA tournament. Is that still the case? You haven't watched a second? I haven't watched a second. I didn't know Jalen Suggs. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know Jalen Suggs hit a last second shot until, you know, about yesterday morning. I didn't really check social media. I didn't right. see much about it, but um, it's just been tough to watch it. Uh, but, you know, I've been keeping myself busy with sure. other things, with being with my family and being with my friends for once. Well, that's actually what I wanted to transition into. Great segue uh, premonition there is I wanted to talk about life in the bubble this year. And, and I brought this up on several podcasts in the last month is, uh, and especially I brought it up in the, in the post Oregon podcast to try to get people to have some type of understanding uh, of context of the year that you guys just went through as student athletes. And I'm guessing it was probably what the, when did you guys begin to sequester away from your families? And did you really, were you not really allowed to go home and be around people? And how much of a mental toll do you think, how much of a mental grind was this year more than any other year because of the bubble aspects? Yeah, I, it was, it was very, very hard. Um, I know, you know, a lot of people on my team will say the same thing of not being around family, especially for myself. My family lives you know, 35 minutes away. I'm used to going home on weekends and mm -hmm. off day and being around them. So it was hard not seeing them after games. It's really started back in uh, Halloween, really, was the first time we told everyone on the team, like, we need to settle down. No one's going out in the bars. No one's going out to see their friends. No one's seeing family after games. It's just going to have to – how it's going to be for the next six months. And I can honestly say the fact that we bought into that shows how much mm. we cared about mm. winning this year. Um, you know, people might say differently of some games, the guys not being ready. Um, but the fact that we were able to sacrifice that much shows how much we cared about you know this season and wanting it to run smoothly. 
Um, there's a lot of instances where, you know, we, we, we win a big game. We want to go out with our friends. We want to go see it. Right. We couldn't, we couldn't do that. We couldn't live the college life. And we were basically working a job and, you know, providing entertainment for, you know, so many fans. And we were happy to do so. We were grateful that we were even given the chance to play this year. And the mm-hmm. fact that we didn't go on any pauses throughout the entire year shows how dedicated we were. Um, and, you know, it was very, very tough. You know, I went through, you know, a couple – times beginning of the year where I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Just being mm. doing the same thing every single day, getting up, you know, having breakfast, go to practice, going back to my apartment. It was like that every single day. And it took a lot of, you know, willpower for myself to get through it. You know, thank God my girlfriend came to see me a couple of times after getting tested. Um, but you know, shit, that was a literally only person I was able to see outside the public. Mm. And um, it also helped, you know, another point of it, just being with the teammates because we all shared the kind of the same common denominator of getting through this tough time. And, you know, we we're all so close as a team. I think that it ultimately helps in the wrong one of just, you know, figuring out this, you know, whole different era that no one's ever been, been through before. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you guys get in your forties and fifties and sixties, uh, maybe even before then you look back and say, man, I probably as tight and close to these guys as anybody else on the planet because of that, uh, that bubble that you lived in. Um, let's wrap things up here with a couple of light, uh, fun things. They don't have to be long answers. Um, your greatest on court memory. Greatest on court memory. It's hard to beat the Wisconsin game my freshman year. Uh, uh, just not even the aspect of me. Uh, when people ask me that question, usually the answer for Wisconsin game on the court because it wasn't even the fact I hit the shot. It was the fact of being there on warm-ups and seeing, you know, Andy North, who was a big-time Wisconsin mm-hmm. fan, go over to see my family members behind the bench, watching all the assistant coaches greet my family members, mm-hmm. watching, you know, so many of these – people that I met through my years at Wisconsin be there with my family and I'm playing in an Iowa Jersey. Mm -hmm. It just, it felt really bizarre, but it was so memorable because of that. Like it almost felt like, you know, this is once in a lifetime opportunity. Someone's not experiencing this, you know, ever. And, you know, see my family still, you know, rekindle those relationships. Right. It was very, I even got emotional before the game. I was like, this is pretty, pretty damn cool. I'm here at this point right now. Yeah. Did I'm sure you've seen the photos of that. The one dude in black and gold in the seat. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen, have you ever like, has that guy ever gotten in touch with you? Do you know who that is? I hope he does because I have actually a big, uh, mural mural that this guy, uh, I believe he painted for me and I think he passed away. Really unfortunate. Oh, wow. You know, tragedy. He passed away yeah. about a week and a half later of, you know, giving, wow. him, giving it to me, gave it to Bobby Hansen. Um, and Bobby Hansen was kind enough to give it to me as well. And mm-hmm. um, it's hanging up big in my room. Um, I can see the guy in, <laughs> sitting up like this with the with the Iowa. And but yeah, I, you, hope, I hope to you meet see, him someday. Yeah, we got to make Twitter. You got to do your thing. Whoever <laughs> that guy is, if you know that guy, you got to get him to tweet at Jordan because as big as his arms are up above his head, there's things down below that you can't see. They're just as big. That guy had a set on him to do that. <laughs> I, that's one of my favorite pictures ever. So you, you, your, your, your greatest off court, off court moment, uh, off court celebration. Like we get a chance sometimes to see the assistant coaches and you guys doing the, you know, the body celebrations in the locker room. But what was that, you know, can't wait to get to the locker room because what of what we just did. What what was what was that? What was that best moment? Oh man, there are so many through the years. Um, you now the Cincinnati game, my junior year, that was that was very very special. We made the comeback, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't think anything can top the Ohio State game playing at Ohio State. And we're, we were struggling that, that point of the year this year. Yeah. A lot of people wrote us off. I think we jumped to or fell behind to like low, low bottom 10 or mm-hmm. um, next 10. Um, we mm-hmm. weren't in the top 10 anymore. And we won that game. And I think we finished up winning our last eight of the last 10 games of the season. Yeah. And really turned things around. And the fact that we won that game kind of showed like, all right, we're here to stay. It's going to be an issue for teams to play us moving forward. We're just not going to fold. And I think that's as much as there has been, you know, in the locker room after games, that has to be up there because we, how much we went through this year. Yeah. It, it, it was the biggest win in the Fran McCaffrey era. 
and it's one of the biggest wins in Iowa basketball, I think, in the last 25 years, if not dating back to the late 80s, and I've seen them all. Um, a 25-foot three-point shooting contest, Jordan Bohannon versus Caitlin Clark. Who's going to win that? <laughs> Anyone that knows me personally, I'm always gonna <laughs> bet on my. I'm gonna bet I, I, on myself. I knew that was your answer. I knew that was your answer. <laughs> yeah. Does Brad Davison get a bad rap? It's funny you bring that up because he's very close with me. We're close with each other off the court. Very great person. You know, strong believer in Jesus, and mm-hmm. you know, understanding his faith and how important that is to life in general. But for whatever reason, when he gets on the court, it's a different. It's a different human being, and. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have too much respect to him on the court. I will say that, but off the court, I have tremendous respect for him and how he lived his life. Those people listening to this know that I'm not a huge fan, but I also separate it and can freely admit that if, if Brad Davison was wearing the Iowa Jersey, he'd probably be one of my all time favorites. So (laughs) I, 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 I can admit that. Well, Jordan, I really appreciate you coming on and doing this and stay on when I get done taking this off. Cause I want to tell you something else. This guy told me today that I didn't want to bring up, um, on the air, but, um, you know, obviously um, the season didn't end the way that you and your teammates wanted it to. And, uh, you know, Mark and I talked about that a great deal, talked about it in the instant reaction show. Um, and I also tell people this, that I've tried to, you know, do whatever it is that I do, comment, cover whatever it is that I do this team and be objective about the games that happen while freely admitting I want Iowa to win each and every game. And I can say without a doubt, um, the one one of the things that got me looking forward through the COVID tunnel that we were kind of all in last year was getting this basketball season in. And that meant that you guys had to go through what you did, you know, uh, from the mental standpoint and from the being separated from your family standpoint and all of that. And I and I recognize that. And um, that was probably the second most enjoyable Iowa basketball season of my life, uh, really close to the 86, 87 season. And, um, you know, if you have played your last game for Iowa, uh, I don't know that there's ever going to be anybody that has a swagger that you had. And I said, I used that word off the top before you injected it. (laughs) Um, it's been a hell of a lot of fun, man. And, uh, as you uh, once wrote, thanks for the memes. Really appreciate that. I appreciate it so much. It's been an unbelievable ride, you know, like, like you're talking about, the fact that we didn't end this year, right? You know, I played arguably one of my worst games ever to finish my career or potentially my career. Um, it, it's it's unfortunate, but, you know, the memories I made with, with my teammates, my family is traveling across the country to see me mm-hmm. play. I will ever trade that for the world, and I will forever cherish, you know, every single of those seconds that I've had on the court and away from the court with my family.